This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. This summer, hundreds of billions of tons of ice melted off Greenland. The runoff from July alone measurably raised sea levels around the world. Super scientist Kevin Trenberth from the U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research talks about hotter oceans, stronger hurricanes like Dorian, and forces melting Greenland ice two to three times faster than scientists thought possible even 15 years ago. Explaining our dangerous future, Kevin makes a surprising announcement about his own. This famous scientist is leaving Trump's America as the United States of Denial guts climate protection regulations. Radio Ecoshock. Is the astounding melt on Greenland this summer due to natural atmospheric cycles rather than global warming? Dr. Kevin E. Trenberth specializes in the transport of heat, water, and energy in the atmosphere and ocean. He was a pioneer in the study of El Nino and La Nina events and a lead author for three reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. Originally from New Zealand, Dr. Trenberth is a distinguished senior scientist in the Climate Analysis Section at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, located in Boulder, Colorado. It is an honor to welcome Kevin Trenberth back to Radio Ecoshock. In July, a bizarre heat wave poured out of North Africa, setting record-smashing temperatures in many European countries. And then abnormal heat appeared over Greenland. Kevin, were those the same or different heat waves? I don't know, actually. Um, and that's not a question I'm sure I have a, have a good answer for. The other thing, other part of that, the answer uh, is, of course, that it wasn't just these two. There were major heat waves in the United States before that. So the whole northern hemisphere really was, uh, or quite a bit of it, was experiencing higher than normal heat, let's say that. Well, it was a little bit sequential, though. I think the weather situation that was responsible for the heat waves in the central and eastern parts of the U.S. was part of the weather system which helped pick up the air from the Sahara and uh, northern Africa and brought it into Europe. And so in that sense, the heat waves may be a little bit related. Uh, but that, that, of course, doesn't really carry through to Alaska. Uh, the Alaskan heat wave is very likely a, a different animal. Now, a group of scientists led by the Belgian researcher Javier Fetwis suggest that the massive meltwater release from Greenland in 2019 was mainly driven by a natural atmospheric cycle called the North Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO, and I'm wondering, this sort of counters the obvious that the Arctic is wildly warmer this century. Surely that is causing Greenland to melt. Kevin, what are your thoughts on this? Ah, well, it's really always a combination of both, isn't it? So nowadays, uh, there is nothing completely natural. But one way of thinking about it is that the, the day-to-day weather is largely natural variability. But it's set in an environment with, which has changed and it has changed in the memory of the climate change is through the oceans. And so the oceans are systematically warmer than they used to be, and the air above the oceans is warmer and moister than it used to be. Now, in addition, of course, at high latitudes, there is quite a bit less ice. There's less sea ice. There's already less uh, glacial ice on land in various places. And so that's the different environment that the weather is now occurring in. So when you have a heat wave, it's largely caused immediately by the anticyclone, the very high pressure that occurs, and often with the winds from in the northern hemisphere out of the south. So they're, they're warm winds and a very settled weather. And that's when we get the, the highest temperatures. And so it's partly a weather phenomenon always. The North Atlantic Oscillation uh, certainly helps to play a role in setting up patterns in uh, Greenland and Europe. Uh, it's most active in the winter time, but in the winter time, when it's very warm in Europe, it, it's very cold in Greenland. And when it's very warm in Greenland, it's very cold in Europe. That's the way the weather situation sits up. And in the summertime, the North Atlantic Oscillation is usually not as strong. So 
I, I, I'm more inclined to think that, yes, the weather and the natural variability is, is playing a role in helping to determine when the heat wave occurs and where it occurs, but the setting for it, the environment for it, is very much related to the overall warming of the planet, the so-called global warming. The concept of North Atlantic Oscillation, it's not widely known to the public, and struggling to grasp it, we're offered the analogy of the better-known El Nino-La Nina cycle, also called ENSO, and you were a pioneer on the impacts of ENSO. Is that a good way to understand the NAO? Well, it's still a somewhat different animal. ENSO, El Nino, uh, involves very much the interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean. And as a result, it has a, uh, quite a substantial memory. And so the evolution of an El Nino event takes at least a year. And, you know, El Ninos occur about every three to uh, five or maybe three to seven years, something like that. And that relates very much to the interactions with the ocean. The North Atlantic Oscillation, on the other hand, is just an atmospheric phenomenon. It's, it's not involved in the ocean. It doesn't have the same memory that uh, the El Nino phenomenon has. And so it often can set up a pattern that can persist for uh, a few months. And so it's a it's longer time scale than normal weather, but it, it's not quite the same as El Nino in that regard. But it is very much a preferred pattern. We can simulate it very well in our models, and it, it, it occurs largely because of the you know, the disposition of where the land is and especially where Greenland is uh, because, of, because of the way in which it blocks the otherwise uh, westerly flow that, would, that might prefer to occur in that region. It worries me. It seems like a little dangerous to suggest that Greenland will right itself towards cooling in a new cycle of the NAO instead of just melting during this and the following centuries as the world surpasses two or three degrees of warming. Is that a worry? Well, yes, Greenland, of course, once you start melting ice, a lot of that becomes irreversible. You can't just put it back. I mean, we do have a, a, an annual cycle where it snows in the wintertime, and, and we do put uh, some ice back. But, you know, big melting of, of ice like has been happening in Greenland, you know, that's largely gone now, I think. And so this is a part of the process whereby, you know, Greenland is on a track to melting under the current environmental conditions that exist, uh, especially with the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, let me, let me go back just a little bit, because if you go back, say, 15 years or something like that, we tended to treat Greenland like a great big ice block. And it was estimated that if you wanted to melt it and you had quite warm conditions, like the kind of conditions we might expect to occur it would take two or 3,000 years to melt Greenland. But the best estimates now are that it would actually take less than 1,000 years. But it's still a quite a long time. And the difference is because now we are taking into account all of the complex crevasses and fractures and water that runs across the surface of Greenland. And it's not a, a big ice block at all. It's actually quite dynamic. And there are glaciers within the Greenland ice cap itself that flow to the ocean. Uh, and, you know, exactly where they, where they go, it does depend a little bit on the weather and, and how much, how active they are certainly depends uh, a bit on the weather. But uh, it's, um, it's melting. Could an emerging new climate regime change the North Atlantic Oscillation itself? What do you think? Well, that's possible because it does relate to the latitude of the overall westerlies. And uh, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation is really a weakening or a strengthening of the overall westerlies across the North Atlantic. And uh, in the positive phase, the westerlies are uh, active uh, further north. The storm track uh, is uh, further north. It's very warm in, in Europe and the whole, all of the storms that go all the way from Europe into Siberia uh, tend to have a particular track. And in the negative phase, the whole pattern tends to shift further south, and it's uh, a lot weaker in the north, and you get very cold conditions in that case in, in Europe. And so um, 
And so as climate change develops, uh, the overall pattern, I, I suppose one way to think about it is that it might become a little more summer-like. And in summertime, the North Atlantic Oscillation is simply not as active as it is in winter. We saw a similar level of Greenland ice loss, I'm told, in 2012, although it happened much faster. Is it possible we're entering a period where supermelts become more common, returning faster as climate change develops? Yeah, so t- 2012 is the year of the lowest uh, Arctic uh, sea ice amount at the moment. And it was set up by a very large, persistent anticyclone that developed over part of the Arctic region. Uh, there was a lot of sunshine at, at just the right time. And uh, in the Arctic, as soon as you start to get sunshine and some ice melts, then there's uh, less reflection back to space. And so there's a a feedback process that can uh, amplify conditions. This year, uh, you know, I I think they are very likely challenging to see whether or not the Arctic sea ice might be at uh, record low levels and, and maybe beat out 2012. We'll have to see just how that turns out. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a weather aspect to that. So 2012 holds the record at the moment, but we certainly expect to see more of those kind of things. Well, regarding sea ice loss, we also have new science published in Nature Climate Change from Russell Blackport's team, and it counters observations by Jennifer Francis and others that Arctic sea ice loss may be related to changes in the jet stream and colder winters in parts of North America. Uh, where do you come in regarding that discussion? Uh, well, it, the, the work from Jennifer Francis and so on has argued that the changes in the sea ice loss and uh, and the other changes in the Arctic are causing the changes in the jet stream and the changes in the weather farther south. And I, I certainly think that's a very questionable argument. But going in the other direction, I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever. The changes in the jet stream and even changes in El, when we have an El Nino event, we get surges of uh, warm air up into Alaska, and, uh, and the whole pattern of the weather can change, and, and that's one of the big factors in amplifying the ice loss from one year to the next. That's, that's uh, partly why it, uh, why it fluctuates. But uh, the question is, what about going in the other direction? If there's a loss of sea ice, how does that affect the weather systems? How does that affect the jet stream? The difficulty is that in the summertime or the late summer, that's when the sea ice loss is, is the biggest, whereas the uh, wintertime, there's no sunshine. And so if, the sea, if there's less sea ice, the sun feedback uh, effect uh, can't come into play. Uh, and so it's, it would have to be the oceans directly, and you can do the sums, and it ju- just simply doesn't add up in my view. And your research into the ways atmospheric heat is stored in the ocean is highly cited. Is the transfer of human-induced heat continuing into the ocean in an orderly way, or is that changing as a sink? Well, it's, it, on a global basis, it's, it's pretty regular. In fact, that's the best single indicator that the planet is warming. The um, 2018 is the warmest year for the global oceans. 2017 is the second warmest now, it turns out 2015 is the third warmest, and 2016 is the fourth warmest. The reason 2016 is a little bit less than 2015 is actually because there was a big El Nino event then, and some heat during, uh, during an El Nino event, some heat comes out of the ocean back into the atmosphere, and that's why we tend to have the warmest global mean surface temperatures in 2016. So 2016 is the warmest year for the surface temperatures, but for the oceans, 2018 uh, stands out. Now, where the warmest patch in the ocean occurs certainly moves around from one year to the next. So in 2017, one of the warmest patches was in the Gulf, and that led to uh, Harvey and uh, all of the hurricane activity, uh, uh, Maria and Irma, uh, in that region. uh, That was a big factor. Uh, But in 2018, Um, One of the warmest patches was off of the coast of the Carolinas. Uh, And so, uh, you know, other places in the Indian Ocean this this past year, there were two very unusual, you know, they call them cyclones, but it's effectively a hurricane that went into uh, the Mozambique area 
and caused tremendous uh, flooding and unusual damage uh, in Africa. And then there was another one called uh, Fani that uh, went up into uh, India and Pakistan that uh, also caused uh, quite a lot of damage. And so those were were quite unusual in that regard. So this, these, you know, where the hot spots occur from one year to the next can certainly vary, and that's partly because of things like El Nino and 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 uh, maybe the North Atlantic Oscillation or the weather more generally. Uh, and so um, where the hotter spot occurs certainly can vary. But as a whole, the oceans are warming up. There's no doubt whatsoever. It seems to me a lot of the newest science coming about uh, Antarctica melting also cites a uh, hotter ocean uh, affecting the ice melt there. Well, uh, Antarctica and in the southern oceans are a very interesting case. Our analysis suggests that, that some of the biggest warming is actually occurring in the southern oceans, but the difference is that there are very strong winds there, and a lot of that heat gets carried down to greater depths in the ocean. And so how much of it is manifested at the surface where it can affect the sea ice and the sea ice distribution, uh, that, that is one of the things that can vary a bit from year to year. And there was a period of time where the nature of the winds uh, was leading to an increase in Antarctic sea ice, uh, and, you know, that, that that's, can happen if the winds happen to be coming or blowing off of the continent more uh, and they carry the sea ice out further. So the sea ice extent is not necessarily a very good indicator because it may be quite thin. But uh, in, in the last few years, we've seen some remarkably low Antarctic sea ice amounts and, uh, and you know, the Antarctic region seems to be catching up a little bit with uh, what's going on in the Arctic. Kevin Trenberth, why are you moving back to New Zealand? Partly uh, because I have family there. My daughter has moved there, and uh, my grandkids are there, and I'm close to retiring. And so, uh, and so that's a big incentive. But I have to say that I'm quite upset with the Trump administration and the Republicans and their approach to uh, this whole problem. It has affected uh, my funding and the ability to do research, and I think they're jeopardizing the futures of uh, the next generations and, uh, and the planet Earth. And, uh, and it's been a very, very disappointing response. And, and, you know, it's one thing to have a president who is off the rails, but it's another thing to have the Congress go along with him. And uh, that's the part that upsets me more than anything, I think. And, uh, you know, there are some other reasons as well. I mean, New Zealand... And the way it which it reacted with regard to guns and the shooting that occurred there versus the United States. You know, the United States surely can do better. Well, as we wrap up here, are there mysteries of Earth's operation that you still hope to tackle from New Zealand? Uh, well, you know, we've got what I think is some quite nice work that's uh, submitted for publication at the moment. We've been able to balance the energy budget much more accurately than we've ever been able to do that before. And now I'm not just referring to the global picture, which is we've had a handle on for some time, but uh, locally. And so we can actually track much better what's going on in the oceans locally and uh, how it relates to what's going on in the atmosphere. And I mentioned to you before these hot spots that are associated with uh, hurricanes and so on. And so as the climate varies and changes, uh, one of the goals is to be able to track these things in close to real time and to use that information for better forecasts, better forecasts of, you know, the entire hurricane season. Uh, there are forecasts made of that, uh, but they're, they're not very specific. And, uh, you know, maybe they can get better. Uh, and there have been a number of marine heat waves in various parts of the world oceans. Uh, there was one... Just a few years ago, uh, 2015-16 or thereabouts in the North Pacific, which they estimate uh, led to the loss of over 100 million cod. And uh, it, it, it had profound effects that have been measured throughout the entire food web, all the way from the phytoplankton to the zooplankton, the, the uh, small uh, fish, uh, larger fish, uh, all of the things that prey on the fish, including the whales, is, there was a big loss of, uh, 
uh, whales uh, that was documented, and uh, and then there are you know things like sea otters and and marine animals along the coast uh, that uh, are affected by uh, these kind of things. And you know just recently there has been a marine heat wave uh, in the South Tasman Sea, which is you know right near New Zealand, and there was one uh, there uh, about uh, what 2016 as well. Uh, perhaps in association with the big El Nino event, and uh, and so there have been all kinds of strange creatures and fish and so and so on showing up in places like Tasmania, you know, in the southern part of Australia, and uh, surfers have really been enjoying the surf in Tasmania. Normally, the waters there are quite cool, and so uh, these kind of things are are happening around the world and are having big and sometimes quite alarming impacts. I think marine heat waves is a topic that I'm going to have to cover in a show because it it obviously doesn't cover by TV news in the United States or Europe because we live on land, but it's a very important thing, and I thank you for that insight. We've been speaking with Dr. Kevin Trenberth, a distinguished senior scientist specializing in climate analysis at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. You can find links to find out more in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us. You're most welcome. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org.